السلام عليكم وعليكم السلام ورحمة الله Good morning How are you? الحمد لله Just finish celebration of year 5 Hoping إن شاء الله We'll celebrate you soon uh, How many participants is supposed to be attended today? 36 I suppose 36 for our class so still there is six candidates yet, not yeah. yet come. you must finish attendance sheet with signing all of them and admitted beliefs okay uh, we'll just try to give them a moment if they join us let okay. us okay. okay okay let us start by um tab other than shaitan Again and again, my advice for you when starting your year three to start strong. Don't start lazy, please. Uh, you have about 1,000 a day. If you are building your clinical sense and your clinical abilities and your theoretical knowledge, at the end of this 1,000 a day, suppose, inshallah, you will be very strong. So don't forget. To keep working every day, you must add something to yourself in the career of medicine. Uh, if you did that, you will, inshallah, a competent, not for UIA, maybe competent for Malaysia or even for overseas, which is our goal. Okay. Uh, today we have seminar with the first one to present. Okay, so okay, you can uh, start now, Nagiha. I should start now, Doctor? Yes. Okay, let me share my screen first. Uh, everyone need to turn off his uh, voice, please. No need, let, let us, our colleague only, she is the one is using her microphone. Okay, so can everyone see my screen? Yes. Okay. Nice, the screen. can you make it uh, full screen? Okay, all right. Yes, now it's okay. good. Um, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. A very good morning. I read to our uh, beloved and respected uh, lecturer, Dr. Mossad, and the, the fellow members of the floor. So today I will be presenting about nephropathic syndrome. Uh, wait, uh, today is nephrology team and I will be the first presenter. My second, uh, my present, second presenter will be Nur Shazwani with the topic of acute glomerulonephritis. And the third presenter will be Umi Ifa with the topic of UTI in childhood. So uh, let's begin our presentation of nephropathic syndrome. Uh, firstly, uh, the, the contents of my presentation will be in three parts which is uh, the first part is terminology, pathophysiology, etiology, and clinical presentation. Second part is approach to nephrotic syndrome. And third part is congenital nephrotic syndrome. Uh, okay, we go through the first part, which is terminology, pathophysiology, etiology, and clinical presentation of nephrotic syndrome. Terminology, nephrotic syndrome is defined as a clinical manifestation of glomerular disease associated with heavy nephrotic range proteinuria, hyperlipidemia, hypoalbuminemia, and peripheral edema. Nephrotic range proteinuria is, uh, is when uh, the protein levels in the urine is uh, higher than 3.5 grams over 24 hours, or it can also be determined by urine protein creatinine ratio, which is higher than two. Hypoalbuminemia is when the albumin, albumin level is lower than 2.5 grams per deciliter, 
and hyperlipidemia is when the cholesterol level is more than 200 mg per deciliter. Uh, the pathophysiology of uh, nephrotic syndrome consists of two, which is uh, the role of the protocyte as well as role of immune system. Uh, protocyte is a highly differentiated epithelial cell located on the outside of glomerular capillary loop. Its food processes interdigitate with each other, connected by slip diaphragm and terminate at basement, mem basement membrane. Okay, so for the functions of protocyte, uh, it, uh, uh, it works as a structural support of capillary loop and it is a major component of uh, glomerular filtration barrier towards proteins. And it is involved in the synthesis and repair of glomerular basement membrane. And the functions of slit diaphragm, it is one of the major impediments to protein from, towards protein permeability across the capillary wall. And it, is, uh, it has uh, important components such as nephrine, podocin, CD2 AP, and, uh, and alpha actinin 4. So when there is uh, injury towards the podocyte or when the, there is genetic mutations of genes that produce the podocyte, it will lead to increase in glomerular permeability. Therefore, it will lead to increased protein leakiness across the glomerular, glomerular wall into the urinary space. This will result in proteinuria. Okay, so uh, when there is increased glomerular permeability, they will lead, uh, it will lead to increased filtration of the plasma proteins. Therefore, there will be urinary loss of proteins carrying the hormones, metals, and vitamins. When there is uh, increased filtration of the proteins, it will lead to albuminuria. Albumin albuminuria will uh, cause uh, increased tubular reabsorption of the filtered protein and lead to tubular damage and catabolism of the albumin. When there is tubular damage, it will lead to tubular dysfunction. When uh, there is albuminuria as well, uh, there will be loss of um, uh, protein or albumin, particularly uh, album, uh, albumin because albumin is a small um, molecule and it will lead to low, uh, when there is hypoalbuminemia, it will, there will be decrease in plasma protein level, right? So there will be uh, reduced intravascular oncotic pressure uh, and then it will lead to leakage of the plasma water uh, into the intestinal This is uh, This is what will lead to edema, which is the most uh, common uh, presenting symptom in chart. And uh, when there is um, depletion of intravascular oncotic pressure as well, there will be secretion or simulation of uh, vasopressin, uh, vasopressin uh, and aldosterone. Or we, we could say that there will be activation of the RAS system. Uh, therefore, there will be uh, increase in sodium and water retention by the tubules that will further lead to edema. Uh, when there is increased filtration of plasma proteins as well, there will be alterations in coagulation factors because there will be urinary loss of antithrombin, uh, antithrombin 3 and protein S, which is, uh, which is the favorite, which will uh, cause thromboembolism. Uh, it is also because uh, when uh, fibrinogen is not filtered, or fibrinogen, uh, fibrinogen is a big molecule, so it will not go through the uh, membrane. Therefore, there will be uh, a lot of fibrinogen in the blood but less fibrinolytic agents. So that will lead to hypercoagulability state of the uh, uh, blood uh, and lead, may lead to thromboembolism. Okay, when there is uh, increased filtration of the plasma proteins as well, uh, it will lead to uh, altered turnover of rates of, of immunoglobulins. This is because uh, immunoglobulins can also be lost in the urine. Therefore, there, uh, it can also reduce cellular immunity and increase uh, the risk of infections. When uh, there is albumin, uh, increased filtration of plasma proteins, it will become albuminuria, and it can also lead to malnutrition. Uh, when there is a uh, hypoalbuminemia, uh, uh, because it is to, uh, to compensate, uh, to compensate the, the uh, low level of proteins in the blood, the liver will, uh, will produce a lot more uh, uh, proteins. However, uh, liver also pro uh, produce uh, or Liver also produce uh, lipoproteins, therefore there will be hyperlipoproteinemia and lead to lipiduria. So uh, this is the, uh, the root of how the uh, presenting symptoms would look like. And the second uh, theory is that uh, immune system, uh, minimal change nephrotic syndrome may occur after the viral infections and allergen challenge. And MCNS can, can occur in children with Hodgkin lymphoma or T cell lymphoma. And uh, nephrotic syndrome can also occur due to immunosuppression caused by drugs such as corticosteroids and cephalosporin uh, as that will also contribute to the pathogenesis. 
so next is the etiology of nephrotic syndrome, which will be classified into two, which is primary and secondary. For primary or idiopathic, uh, it is the commonest type of uh, nephrotic syndrome in children that affects approximately 90% of children with uh, nephrotic syndrome. And it is associated with primary glomerular disease without an identifiable co uh, causative disease or drug. And minimal change disease is the most common cause of idiopathic nephrotic syndrome, uh, which uh, consists of more than 80%. Um, minimal change disease is more common in boys than girls uh, with, the, with the ratio of 2 over 1. And it is most common between two and six years old. Uh, secondary cause or, uh, of nephrotic syndrome should be suspected in patients uh, um, more than eight years old and those with hypertension, hematuria, renal dysfunction, extra renal symptoms, or depressed complement levels. It can also be due to infectious agents such as Hep B virus, Hep C virus, filaria, leprosy, and HIV. Uh, secondary cause can also be developed during therapy with drugs and chemicals. So this is the list of causes of childhood nephrotic syndrome. Uh, so uh, as I said earlier, idiopathic, uh, idiopathic nephrotic syndrome can be caused by minimal change disease, but it can also be caused by focal segmental glomerulose sclerosis or FSGS. It can also be caused uh, membrane nephropathy and glomerulonephritis associated with nephrotic syndrome, such as membrane proliferative glomerulonephritis and others, and secondary causes, uh, infections, drugs, and more. Um, next is an uh, explanation on MCNS, which is minimal change, uh, disease, minimal change nephrotic syndrome, which is present in 85 to 90% of patients less than 6 years old of age. And the glomeruli may appear normal or uh, just a minimal increase in messenger cells and matrix. Uh, kidney functions may appear normal. Uh, and under uh, immunofluorescence microscopy, there will be negative findings. Uh, Electron microscopy, there will be investment of epithelial cell food processes. Um, uh, and more than 95% um, of uh, children with MCNS uh, usually respond to um, corticosteroid therapy. Okay, so let's see in this uh, photo. Okay, uh, in this photo, this is the uh, normal glomeruli, which we can see uh, they have uh, separate food processes. However, in MCNS, you can see the, uh, here, uh, the glomerular capillary uh, has fused food processes. Okay, here uh, we can see that uh, the, it is a normal glomeruli, which keeps the protein inside the blood, uh, uh, which keeps the protein molecules inside the blood. But when there is uh, MCNS, uh, protein molecules will spill into the urine due to the abnormalities of the capillary wall. So the clinical manifestation of MCNS can be uh, mild edema, which is mo the, the most common uh, presentation, uh, edema around the eyes uh, and lower extremities, and it may decrease throughout the day. Uh, because of this type of uh, edema or swelling, that decrease throughout the day, it is often confused as um, allergic reactions because uh, as we know, uh, allergic reaction can also appear with uh, preobatic edema. And uh, the edema in this patient can also become progressively uh, generalized. And, and patient can also uh, present it with ascites, pleural effusion, genital edema, uh, anorexia, irritability, abdominal pain, diarrhea, and anemia. And important features of MCNS is that it is it, uh, it doesn't have the, uh, the presence of hypertension and gross hematuria because this is uh, known to be the symptoms of nephrotic syndrome. Okay, next is messenger pro proliferation, which is characterized by a uh, diffuse increase in messenger cells and matrix on light microscopy. Um, we can see here uh, is that uh, there is a segmental messenger pro proliferation and also messenger matrix expansion. And it can also uh, appear with thickened uh, glomerular basement membrane and double contour. Uh, in IF, in immunofluorescence microscopy, there will be traced to uh, positive uh, one missing, um, of IgM and IgA staining. And composition and distribution of the immune deposit in immunofluorescence microscopy is actually variable. And C3 deposits are, are almost always present, whereas C4 and C1Q are present in just uh, approximately 50% of the cases. 
uh, and under electron micro microscope, there will be increased numbers of messenger cells and matrix, as well as if, uh, as well as the effacement of epithelial cell processes. And in this case, fifty percent of the patients respond to corticosteroid. Uh, next is focal segmental glomerulosclerosis, in which uh, glomerula will has uh, both lesions, focal and segmental. Okay, it is characterized histologically by sclerosis that affects only some of uh, some, but not all glomerulus, which is termed as focal involvement, and uh, and only segments of each affected glomerulus will be uh, damaged, uh, which is termed as segmental. Therefore, the name is focal segmental. And under light microscopy, uh, there will be lesions, uh, lesions consisting of messenger cell proliferation and segmental scarring. Scarring. Okay, uh, as you can see here. Uh, there is a presence of uh, scarred mass uh, of, and also accumulation of matrix material in just one part of the glomerulus. Uh, under immunofluorescence microscopy, there will be a positive for IgM and C3, C3 staining in the segmental sclerosis part. And under electron microscope, there will be scarring of segmental scarring of glomerular tuff with obliteration of uh, the capillary lumen. Uh, similar lesion can also be seen uh, secondary to uh, HIV infection, vesico urethral reflux, intravenous use of heroin, and other drug abuse. However, in this case, uh, in the case of SSG, FSGS, uh, only 20% of patients will respond to prednisone or the corticosteroid. And the disease is often progressive, that will soon involve all the glomerulus. Uh, and then uh, it will lead to end stage renal disease in most patients. So, this is the clinical presentation of nephrotic syndrome, which we can be lethargy, fatigue, anorexia, depression, uh, skin failure with or without facial edema. Uh, the patient may also have uh, depression, uh, is most uh, commonly presented with ankle edema, uh, pitting, pitting edema, uh, ascites, hydrothorax, uh, scrotal or labial edema. And the, as I said, the patient will have the uh, hypoproteinemia, hypercholesterolemia, and hyperlipidemia. So a second part is approach to nephrotic syndrome, which will consist of history taking, physical examination, investigation, management, and prognosis. Uh, history taking, uh, okay, the case scenario uh, I have uh, provided here is MY, a two-year-old Malay boy, was brought by his mom to the Family Health Care Center of IIUM with a one-week history of swelling of the face. So this will be the um, how we, we take history uh, from the patient and uh, from the mother. So uh, I would like to say, Madam, can you elaborate more on the swelling? Uh, can you explain on when does it start? When does the swelling first notice? And does the symptom progressively develop from one part to another? And the answer is that the mother claims that the swelling started around one week ago. Swelling over the face was present with, in a, with a, initially started around the periorbital area. It is prominent in the morning and gradually progressed to face and legs before affecting the whole body. The swelling decreases by the evening. Uh, next, is, next question will be, even does he has uh, any fever or any other symptoms that you notice? And the mother will say that uh, he had a history of fever, which is high grade, continuous type associated with chills and rigors. He also had cough with uh, whitish uh, colored sputum and no false smelling. The mom also noticed that her child has been passing less amount of urine. And he also expressed irritability and had diarrhea. He also appears lethargic and was claimed to be less active than usual. So uh, this will be the uh, findings that we have from the uh, history taking. Uh, the, for past medical drug history and birth history, as well as developmental history, there, there is no significant findings. Uh, for nutritional history, uh, the patient lost his appetite around the time that the swelling started. And uh, family history and social history uh, will have no significant findings. Uh, for physical examination, uh, this is the, the examination that we will do on the patient. Uh, we will check if the patient is conscious and alert or not. Uh, and we will uh, usually find facial puffiness because of the yeah, swelling, uh, because of the edema. And we have to check if the patient has respiratory distress and if the patient uh, is uh, irritable. Uh, and because it is a child, we should also look for uh, any dysmorphism such as um, Trisomy 21 syndrome or the Down syndrome. Uh, and we should also uh, 
find out if the patient is well or ill looking uh, and the patient may appear lethargic uh, or fatigue. Uh, we, can, we should also look for symptoms of uh, if the patient is hypnotic and increase in jugular venous pressure because uh, uh, edema can also be caused in, um, can also be found in heart failure. Therefore, we have to find out uh, other symptoms of heart failure to rule out the, uh, the possibility. And the vital signs that we should look for in the patient is uh, heart rate, uh, respiratory rate, temperature, blood pressure, SpO2, and pulse. And, uh, and we should also find out about the uh, height, weight, and head circumference of the patient. Okay, uh, this is uh, uh, the, the systemic examination that we should do on the patient. We should look for uh, any features of SLE, such as rash in the skin, on the skin, and uh, uh, in the eyes, which we, will, we might find periabotic edema. Uh, and in the limbs examination, we, we can find fitting edema in the lower extremities uh, bilaterally, or we should also find out if it is unilaterally. Um, and for respiratory examination, we might find faint pulmonary auscultation due to pleural effusion, decreased tetraphrometers, dull percussion, pulmonary, and also pulmonary basal crackles. And for abdominal examination, we might find out uh, abdominal extension, and sh uh, shifting dullness, and dull percussion, percussion due to ascites. And for cardiovascular examination, we should also check it out because uh, um, we, we have to check for murmurs and glab rhythm to rule out the heart failure possibilities. So uh, this is the findings uh, from the patient that I have uh, from the, for the case scenario. This, his vital signs shows a high-grade fever with 39.4 degrees Celsius, and he has hypotension. And open general examination, he appeared irritable and lethargic, along with facial puffiness, uh, especially in the periabotic area. Uh, and on examination of his swelling, he has bilateral pedal swelling. So the investigation that we should do for the patients with nephropathy syndrome is firstly, uh, we have to do a full blood count uh, to check components of the blood, especially uh, because the patient has a possibility of anemia. So we have to check uh, if uh, what, what type of anemia uh, and because we have to treat. Uh, that as well, and uh, we have to, uh, we should do a uh, renal profile uh, to check for urea, uh, electrolyte, and creatinine level. Serum cholesterol should also be done to check uh, for the symptoms of hyperlipidemia to check for uh, hyperlipidemia, and uh, liver function tests uh, should also be done to check for uh, particularly serum albumin. Urinalysis uh, should also be done to check for uh, the color of the urine, uh, the is foamy or frothy and also the presence of protein in the urine. Quantitative urinary protein excretion should also be done uh, by uh, doing a uh, spot urine uh, protein creatinine ratio or 24-hour urine protein. And uh, anti-nuclear factor should, uh, should be done uh, to exclude uh, SLE cause or to, to actually, uh, because SLE can be the, the secondary cause towards uh, nephrotic syndrome. Um, <clears throat> And mental test to, uh, should be done to, before starting steroid therapy. Uh, anti streptolysin O titers should be done to exclude post streptococcal uh, glomerulonephritis. However, it should also be done in, uh, in nephrotic syndrome because the patient have possibilities uh, of uh, getting infections. It has a high, uh, higher risk of getting infections. And we should also do serum uh, complement levels for C3 and C4 to exclude SLE and post-infectious uh, glomerulonephritis. Um, aside from the lab investigation, we should also do um, abdominal ultrasound to check for any anomalies of the kidney. Sorry, uh, I didn't agree to make blanket investigation for the two diagnoses unless you have clue. Sometimes we have nephrotic, either nephritic. Some, sometimes, but which is not so more, you can give like uh, nephrotic nephritic syndrome. It is not typical nephrotic or typical nephritis. There is mixed chart. At the time, uh, better to go for both, but uh, don't go routinely, please. Mm -hmm. blanket, blanket investigation for two causes at the same time. I may consider uh, doing ANA if there is family history also of uh, autoimmune disease or, or the baby has some other signs like mara rash like that. But uh, please, uh, you just try to consider 
investigations to be considered according to history or clinical assessment. Because uh, our issue, if you are, if you are a doctor of blanket investigation, we will lose a lot of our clinical abilities. We must be a good clinician to decide. If you are doing a blanket investigation, it will cost the patient a lot. Also, it will be wasting of investigation unless I have uh, an important clue for that. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Doctor. Uh, okay. okay, so for uh, the case scenario, the results is that um, the urine dipstick indicates proteinuria with no signs of hematuria. Uh, blood testing showed uh, significantly depressed uh, citrine level and also hypoalbuminemia that indicates nephrotic syndrome. Uh, the urine creatinine level was uh, normal, and but epitity was prolonged. Um, so Sorry, let's again. Significant decrease in the C3 level. Is it indicating in nephrotic or nephritic? Mm. Uh, for depressed C3 level, is nephritic. Yes. yes, so take care about this one, need to be revised, mm. please. Okay. Okay. Okay, thank you. Uh, so the serology testing for active infections uh, was turns out positive, uh, and the urine protein creatinine ratio was found to be to be elevated, and the test was done before the administration, uh, which turns out negative. So this is the results that uh, again for uh, protein creatinine ratio. Uh, sometimes you need to come to the your lab referees because some lab are doing the result as per 100 decimeter or 1 ml like that so it, sometimes it will come the normal is 0 0.2 0.2 not 2 so mm -hmm. this time, sometimes you make confusion i am measuring with deciliter or millimeter like that okay okay this, this is the references on the right uh right hello good Ah, yes. Uh, okay, so uh, from this uh, result as well, we can see that the serum lipid profile, all three of all three components are elevated. Uh, so there is a presence of hyperlipidemia as well. Um, for the management, okay, uh, firstly, uh, the, I have summarized the, the drugs that uh, can, that, that is used in managing patients with nephrotic syndrome, which is a uh, mainly corticosteroid, uh, which is uh, prednisone, or uh, cyclophosphamide and uh, cyclosporine are, in, are used to induce remission in nephrotic syndrome. Diuretics can uh, be used to reduce edema. Uh, angiotensin converting enzyme uh, or its inhibitors such as captopril, enalapril, and lis uh, lisinopril is also to uh, reduce uh, edema. And angiotensin 2 uh, is used to reduce proteinuria. Okay, so... Uh, who is jotting down something? Uh, okay, for management, uh, okay, uh, in children with first epi uh, episode of uh, nephrotic syndrome and with uh, mild to moderate edema, uh, the patient, uh, some, in some cases, they can be managed as outpatient. However, the parents must be able to recognize the signs and symptoms of the disease complications. And they, uh, the patients must be taught on how to use the dipstick and and how to interpret the results to monitor the degree of proteinuria at home. And uh, before uh, you before managing the patient as outpatient, we have to uh, rule out tuberculosis uh, prior to starting immunosuppressive therapy with corticosteroid, and we have to confirm a negative result. For the onset of uncomplicated nephrotic syndrome, if the patient is between one to eight years of age, uh, it is uh, likely to have a steroid responsive uh, um, minimal change nephrotic syndrome. Uh, therefore, steroid therapy can be initiated without diagnostic uh, renal biopsy. Uh, however, if the patient have features that makes uh, MCNS less likely, uh, such as the symptoms of gross hematuria, hypertension, renal insufficiency, uh, or the patient uh, is uh, in between age of less than one or more than 12 year old, should be considered for renal biopsy before treatment. 
So treatment of initial episode of nephrotic syndrome uh, in children in children with a uh, presumed uh, MCNS, prednisone or prednisolone uh, can be given through single daily dose of 60 mg over, um, over a day or 2 mg per kilogram per day towards, uh, to a maximum of 60 mg uh, daily for 4 to 6 weeks. Uh, however, we are uh, plus, plus alternate day prednisone uh, starting at 40 mg per m squared uh, every other day or 1.5 mg per kilogram every other day for 8 weeks to 5 months. And we have to taper with the dose. Um, and 80 to 90 percent children actually respond to steroid therapy. And what we mean by uh, respond is that uh, there is uh, attainment of remission within the initial four weeks of corticosteroid therapy. And what is meant by remission is when we find that the urine protein creatinine ratio is lesser than 0 0.2, or uh, the protein on urine dipstick is lesser than one positive one for three consecutive days. Uh, so uh, in managing the clinical circular of the uh, nephrotic syndrome, which is dyslipidemia, we can, it can be managed with a low fat diet, uh, dietary fat intake that is limited to less than 30% of calories, Saturated fat intake, uh, which is uh, less than 10% of calories. And the patient should be given uh, dietary cholesterol intake, uh, which is less than 300 milligram per day. Um, uh, for edema, uh, if the patient have uh, severe symptomatic edema, uh, along with large pleural effusions, ascites, uh, and severe genital edema, of course, the patient has to be hospitalized, not to be managed with uh, outpatient. And if the patient uh, turns to be hyponatremic, uh, we should be give uh, the patient should be on sodium restriction and water uh, or fluid restriction. Uh, diuresis should be should be given uh, through we should administer loop diuretics such as furosemide uh, orally or uh, intravenously, but with extreme caution. Uh, and it is because uh, aggressive diuresis can lead to depletion in intravascular volume and that will lead to increase of acute renal failure and intravascular thrombosis. For infections, uh, because the patient has increased risk of infections in nephrotic syndrome, the family should be counseled on the signs and symptoms of the infection, such as uh, cellulitis, peritonitis, and bacteremia. And uh, if there is any susp uh, suspicion of infection, blood culture should be drawn before uh, starting on empiric uh, antibiotic therapy. And the antibiotic provided must be of broad enough coverage to include pneumococcus and gram-negative bacteria because pneumococcus is uh, the most common um, bacteria to infect uh, the children. Uh, and third, gen uh, third generation uh, cephalosporin should be given intravenously. Uh, is actually a common choice for, uh, for infection to, to avoid infections. Um, Okay, uh, in the case of relapse of nephrotic syndrome, uh, urine protein creatinine ratio of more than two or more than positive uh, three, more than positive three protein on urine dipstick uh, test. Okay. okay, the relapse for nephrotic syndrome is defined through urine protein, protein creatinine ratio of more than two or uh, positive three, uh, more than positive three protein on urine dipstick testing that is uh, taken for three consecutive days. And it is, uh, relapse is actually common, especially in younger children. And it can be triggered by upper respiratory tract infections or the gastrointestinal infections. And it can be treated similar to the initial episode, but daily prednisone is, uh, is shortened. Uh, and daily high prednisone is given until the remission is achieved. And then we can switch to alternate uh, day therapy. Uh, the duration of uh, alternate day therapy is uh, depends on the frequency of relapse of the child. Uh, so in the case of uh, steroid resistance, uh, it is defined as a failure to achieve remission after eight weeks of corticosteroid therapy. And it might require further evaluation uh, such as kidney biopsy, kidney function evaluation, quant uh, and quantitation of urine protein excretion as well as urine deficit testing. And steroid resistance, Steroid resistance is usually caused by FSGS in 80% of the cases uh, and uh, can also be caused by membrane. And there is also uh, cases in membrane proliferative glomerulonephritis or MCNS. So uh, uh, in, in, in 
immunizations of uh, nephrotic syndrome children. Okay, uh, because there is uh, to reduce the risk of serious infections, we have to give full pneumococcal vaccination and uh, influenza vaccination annually to the child and the household and the household members. Uh, and we have to defer giving live vaccines until the prednisone dose given to the child is below or I, is below either one milligram per kilogram daily or two milligram per kilogram on alternate days. And live vaccines is contraindicated in children receiving uh, corticoid sparing agents such as cyclophosphamide and cyclosporine. Okay, so what about those that is um, that uh, cannot uh, receive a steroid or anything? We the candidates to have uh, the alternative to steroid is uh, those who are steroid dependent, uh, frequent relapsers, steroid resistant patients, as well as patients that have severe corticosteroid toxicity. So um, we can give them cyclophosphamide. Uh, to prolong duration of remission and reduce the number of relapse in children with frequently relapsing and, uh, and if the patient is steroid dependent. The side effect of this drug is neutropenia, disseminated varicella, hemorrhagic cystitis, alopecia, sterility, and increased risk of uh, malignancy. So the, uh, how to administer, is, administer the drug is through single oral dose for total of duration for total duration of 8 to 12 weeks. And alternate day prednisone is continued along with cyclophosphamide administration. And during the therapy, white blood cell count must be monitored weekly. Uh, and the drug should be, should be stopped uh, or withheld if the count falls below uh, 5,000 over uh, millimeter cubic. Uh, another alternative towards steroids is that calcineurin inhibitors uh, such as cyclosporine and tacolimus, it is recommended as initial therapy for children with steroid-resistant nephrotic syndrome. And the side effects are uh, hypertension, nephrotoxicity, hirsutism, and gingival, gingival hy hyperplasia. Um, another drug is mycophenolate that, will, uh, that is uh, used to maintain remission in children with steroid-dependent or frequently relapsing nephrotic syndrome. Uh, Levamiso is another drug, which is uh, it is an antihelmetic agent with immunomodulating effects. It is used to reduce risk of relapse, uh, risk of relapse compared to prednisone. And uh, last one is rituxima, which is used to prolong remission in children with steroid dependent or steroid resistant. Uh, most children who respond to cyclosporine, tacrolimus, or mycophenolate tend to relapse when we continue when we discontinue their medications. Uh, aside from that, there is also findings or uh, research that say that ACE inhibitors and angiotensin 2 blockers can be helpful uh, to reduce proteinuria in steroid-resistant patients. So in, in the case scenario, uh, the patient was given optimal supportive treatment consisting of uh, inalapril, which is an ACE inhibitor, prednisolone, uh, intravenous albumin, furosemide, which is a loop diuretic, uh, low salt intake, uh, high caloric and protein diet, and safe injection as antibiotic, as well as ascorin uh, for treatment of cough with mucus. Uh, urine, uh, uh, the urine output and blood pressure was monitored, and uh, successful control of peripheral edema with albumin and the resist was seen in the patient. Uh, there is concomitant increase in serum protein levels uh, with uh, lipid levels uh, decreasing over time without any medication. Uh, so the prognosis of, of nephrotic syndrome, most steroid respon uh, responsive children have repeated relapse that uh, decrease uh, in frequency uh, as the child grows older. And children who rapidly respond to steroid uh, and those who with no relapse during their first six months is likely to have infrequently relapsing course. means that the patient will uh, less likely to relapse. Uh, and steroid responsive child is unlikely to develop chronic kidney disease and will remain fertile because uh, there is no use of prolonged uh, cyclophosphamide therapy. And to minimize the psychologic effect, uh, children with idiopathic nephrotic syndrome should not be considered chronically ill and they should be, uh, they should be led to play with their friends and go to school. Uh, and however, steroid-resistant child, they are most often caused by FSGS, generally have poorer prognosis because they may develop progressive renal insufficiency uh, that, that can lead to end-stage renal disease. 
then the patient will uh, will have to uh, to get dialysis or kidney transplant. However, uh, recurrent uh, nephrotic syndrome actually develops in 30 to 50% of the transplant recipients with FSGS. Uh, the third, let's go through the third part, which is congenital nephrotic syndrome. Uh, it is defined as nephrotic syndrome that manifests at birth or within the first three months of life. And prognosis of congenital nephrotic syndrome, it has poorer prognosis uh, in the first year of life uh, compared to childhood nephrotic syndrome. And it can be classified into two as well, primary and secondary. Primary can be due to variety of syndromes inherited as autosomal recessive disorders, uh, such as Dennis Dress syndrome and Pearson syndrome. And secondary, uh, it may be due to uh, in utero infections, such as CMV, toxoplasmosis, syphilis, and others. Uh, so for etiology uh, of the congenital nephrotic syndrome, I provided here is the one uh, is the genetic cause, uh, which is due to mutations in uh, genes that are responsible for more than 80% of congenital nephrotic syndrome. The genes are NPHS1 gene that encodes for nephrin, which is a key component of podocyte slit diaphragm, uh, which is responsible for the Finnish type of uh, congenital nephrotic syndrome. Uh, MPHS2 gene encodes for producing, which is the protein that interacts with the nephrim at the state nephrim, and it is responsible for uh, familial focal segmental glomerulus sclerosis or FSGS. Uh, MPHS3 uh, is the gene that encodes for phospholipase uh, C epsilon, which is a signaling protein, uh, and it is responsible for early onset nephrotic syndrome. Um, WT1 gene encodes for transcription of tumor suppressor that is uh, involved in kidney and gonad development, and it is responsible for the Danish Dress syndrome type. And uh, LAMB2 is the protein that is the gene that encodes for uh, laminin beta 2, which is a component of glomerular basement membrane, and it is responsible for Pearson syndrome with uh, diffuse messenger sclerosis. So this is the, the table of uh, etiologies for congenital uh, nephrotic syndrome. Uh, we have genetic, uh, such as the one that I have uh, said earlier, Finnish type, uh, and uh, syndrome such as Danish dress syndrome. It can also be caused by idiopathic causes, which is minimal change syndrome, uh, with minimal change nephrotic syndrome, and also infections. So far, uh, NPHS2 and NPHS1 is the most commonly affected gene, which, uh, uh, co which um, consists of uh, approximately 95% of cases. And genetic cause of CNS, uh, genetic cause of congenital nephrotic syndrome do not respond to glucocorticoid or immunosuppressive therapy. However, um, non-genetic causes are often secondary and possibly curable disorders. So the clinical features of congenital nephrotic syndrome is uh, the, the three the triads, which is uh, massive proteinuria, hyperlipidemia, and hyperalbuminemia, uh, plus anasarca, which is generalized edema, and oliguria. The patient can actually be screened for uh, congenital nephrotic syndrome. Uh, the findings will be elevated AFP levels in methanol serum and amniotic fluid. And the diagnosis uh, can be, and for the diagnosis, genetic testing should be done before giving any treatment because, uh, for, because as I said, genetic cause of congenital nephrotic syndrome might fail to respond to immunosuppressive therapy. And extrarenal manifestation is helpful, especially in syndromic cases. Uh, uh, for example, genetic abnormalities in affected uh, male infant suggest a WT1 mutation and the diagnosis of Danish breast syndrome. So we can say that uh, the manifestation outside from renal, uh, outside from renal is helpful to uh, diagnose patients. And the management goals is that we have uh, to maintain good nutrition in the patient. We have to control edema and prevent thrombosis. Uh, we should also prevent, uh, try to prevent infection. And we, uh, the goal uh, to man in managing the patient is to allow the child to reach 9 kilogram weight uh, so that they will be suitable for any renal transplant. Uh, the complications of congenital nephrotic syndrome is failure to thrive, uh, recurrent infections, hypothyroidism, and progression to renal failure to, by two to three years. So this is my references. Uh, is there any questions? No can, you, can you 
can you hear me yes yeah thank you nagiha you did uh, a good job promising for me inshallah for always success referee to your name uh, <laughs> and they also have a good uh, points of arts <laughs> in spite the knowledge are very important but uh, i have just uh, simple comments the references uh, as i told you you must go through the latest editions like nelson we have now the 2020 edition it is available which is 21 edition 2020 uh, because uh, you need to revise uh, some of the knowledge if you can come back to the treatments okay. yes the definition of uh, steroid uh, resistance what's your reference for that uh, it is from Nelson. Which Nelson? Uh, 20th edition. Because I only have uh, the online, uh, the, the PDF form. I don't have the book. If you, ask, if you ask it for any book, you can get it in, from our library. But I will send you also. So please, you must know that, uh, that if, uh, if you are depending on books, you are a bit lagging at least two years from the actual. Sometimes you need even as I send you in, in your uh, question before, you must, uh, you must go for uh, an article update. And our library full of, of things, okay? So I think steroid uh, resistance we need because you said here we need two months. Yes, to say okay. it is steroid Eight resistance. Weeks. Oh, two months. Yeah, I think now it, it, it is revised, maybe different for that. Okay, oh. the next one, the next slide, please. This one, okay? Yeah, yeah, no, no, I think you would, uh, no, come back to the first one, because you said it is confusing between the dose of steroid, which one, it may be the next slide. Well, the regimen for a steroid to start by 60 uh, milligram per square meter. When you are speak, it, it looks a bit confusing for your colleagues because you said it is for four weeks plus. Is it the one? Uh, it, it is not clear in front of me. Is it clear for you, this slide? No, not really. Yes. Uh, can you read it, uh, Nagiha? Read, uh, means that huh? the dose of steroids will give it for. Uh, wait, uh, from the nursing textbook, uh, what I get is that. Um, uh, this is what I get. Yes. So no, come back 60 milligram, come back to the previous one, 60 milligram per kilo for four weeks, then you are going to go for 40 as alternative. Okay, uh, I think. Still not clear for me. Um. Really, it is confusing. Even if you are treating the patient, we will be confused for that. So take care, please. Is it 60 milligram per kilogram uh, per square meter or two milligram with maximum 60? Okay, for four weeks. And then if the patient responds, we will go directly to alternative day, uh, 240 milligram, alternative day like that. So the regimen also it changes, okay? If you need, the, I will send you on the group, the Nelson 21 uh, edition. Okay. Okay, it is very, very important. Can you go through another, uh, the following slides, I believe? Again, the following one. Yeah, for, for edema also, it was a bit confusing for this one. No, no, come back to the this. The previous one, the previous one, edema, 
take care because the patient of nephrotic syndrome, you must uh, write it clearly that number one is the input output chart and vital signs. I mean, the input output chart is very important to know how much you are giving the child. The child now with nephrotic syndrome has uh, two problems. Okay, the first problem he is edematous, a lot of interstitial fluid. At the same time, the intravascular fluid may be very, very shrinkage because the uh, osmotic pressure due to hypoalbuminemia is very low. Mm -hmm. At the time, the patient even can go chuck while he is edematous. And that's the way in medicine, usually you have some challenge for every situation. How can I keep the blood pressure while I am trying to decrease the edema, which can cause burden over ascites, over the chest, can cause uh, pulmonary effusion or pulmonary edema over the heart. So it is very important to not to write we are routinely using the diuretics. It is not like that. It must be the last uh, slide you speak about that clearly that we are going to transfuse albumin while giving some diuretics. Otherwise, the patient can get severe hypotension and the shock. The patient can get thrombosis. It is very important, okay? Uh, I think we need to revise some, uh, some points. Can you continue the... Do we slide next, next the slide? Okay, one by one, if there is something. Okay. okay, so yeah, next. Which one, doctor? Yes, continue. This is the congenital. Congenital is very clear. Take care about diagnosing it because it is very meticulous. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, this is the, ah, the, the, the reference is uh, good that you start by putting the author and then the title. This is a good, but I think the most important point is to go for the latest, uh, latest edition and the one review article from up to date. Which up to date this one? Uh, congenital, or uh, I take from uh, up to date is congenital nephrotic syndrome. Oh, you didn't go for the original one. I think uh, if you go for the up to date for the nephrotic syndrome, we'll find a lot of changes. And to make sure that updated is revised this month or the previous months. Okay. Uh, yes, July. Uh, yeah, for 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 the congenital, yes, I need it for yes. the nephrotic syndrome itself. Uh, for for nephrotic syndrome, I couldn't find the the full list. Uh, just uh, uh, parts like management, uh, um, etiology, like that. Uh, even, that's why I couldn't take from. There. Even even if you go to to Google, he will bring you a lot of uh, references, which is uh, recent now. But our library really uh, offer us a lot of uh, of issues. Okay, so this is an important uh, guidance for you. Uh, medicine is evolving rapidly and it is changing every time. Uh, it may be every five years we have uh, acceptable big uh, percentage that it will be uh, a change in, in our management. So don't be a bit lag after that, okay? okay. Uh, pediatric protocol, did you go through it or not? Uh, protocol, I think uh, the investigation from protocol. Why the others? Because our pediatric protocol, uh, if you started good, I think between year three and year five, you are able to finish the protocol it in, and it is updated edition also. 2020, uh, 2019. I have the fourth edition. Which edition? Uh, fourth. Yes. Uh, the fourth fifth one. Yeah. If you have our protocol, it must be also considered as uh, I mean, references with other studies, okay? Thank you. Thank you. You need to correct that. 
but uh, yes, you, you did well for your collection and the presentation. Uh, you must uh, send it to me back after correction of that mix. Okay. 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 Thank you, Doctor. Uh, welcome. Any good chance, please, to Nagiha or to me. Did you, are you able to, to swallow all this important knowledge by Nagiha? We will revise it after this. <laughs> it's very <Yeah>. important. <laughs> it's a common scenario in the exam and in the clinical life and in the theoretical part. It's very, very important, okay? Okay, let us go for the second presentation, please. Okay, I will share. Can you guys hear me? Yes, yes. Okay, uh, I will share my screen. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. I am Nusha Zwani binti Ma'amiani and I will be uh, discussing about the acute glomerulonephritis. So this is the outline for my presentation. For the definition of acute glomerulonephritis, it comprises a specific set of renal disease which an immunological mechanism triggers the inflammation and proliferation which cause uh, damage to the glomerular tissue. So this acute glomerulonephritis, it comes with an abrupt onset of one or more features of an acute uh, nephritic syndrome, such as the edema. So the initial symptoms is the uh, facial puffiness, microscopic or macroscopic hematuria, oliguria, hypertension, and azotemia. So for the epidemiology, uh, the acute glomerulonephritis represents 10 to 15% of the glomerular disease. Uh, which only one uh, fourth of the patient will come with the acute nephritic uh, syndrome. So the common cause of uh, acute glomerulonephritis uh, in worldwide, it is the IgA nephropathy, while in Malaysia, it is due to the post-streptococcus glomerulonephritis. So the post-infectious uh, glomer glomerulonephritis Glomerulonephritis it can uh, it can occur at any age, but usually it is occur in children aged between five to fifteen years. So the outbreak of the post-streptococcal glomerulonephritis it more common in uh, children aged six to ten years old. So this acute glomerulonephritis is more uh, is predominantly in boys with a ratio of two to one. So uh, actually the acute uh, glomerulonephritis. The most common uh, cause is the post-infectious uh, glomerulonephritis due to the group A beta hemolytic streptococcus infection. So usually patient will, so usually patient will come uh, with uh, symptoms of acute glomerulonephritis about ten days after the after the streptococcus uh, pharyngitis or uh, after about three weeks of cutaneous infection. So for the etiology, we can uh, classify into infectious and non-infectious. So for the infectious, it can be divided into bacteria. So it, bacteria, so it can, so it include the streptococcus, which is the most common cause. The Staphylococcus aureus, Mycoplasma pneumoniae, and Salmonella. The virus, such as the herpes virus, the EBV, varicella, and cytomegalovirus. The fungi and the parasite. So for the non-infectious group. It is less common cause in uh, acute glomerulonephritis, but it can be. Uh, it can be classified into multi-system systemic disease. Uh, it includes the vasculitis, SLE, HSP, the primary renal disease, and the miscellaneous uh, non-infectious cause of the acute glomerulonephritis. So next, we move to the pathophysiology. So um, the acute glomerulonephritis, it's it induced by the antibody mediated immune. So there will be a in situ immune complex or circulate, 
existing immune complex in the glomerulus. So this, uh, the presence of this immune complex will cause inflammation and proliferation of the cell in the glomerulus, which will lead to uh, uh, damage of the glomerulus and in increase uh, and alter the permeability of the glomerulus. So the glomerulus will be permeable to the red blood cell and also the protein. So there will be a visible hematuria because the blood is permitted to pass into the urine. And on microscopy, there will be also the red blood cell cast and uh, we can see a dysmorphic red blood cell. So when the glomerulus is permeable to the uh, protein, so the plasma protein will be uh, filtered out. So there will be a proteinuria in the patient and these inflammatory cells and excessive uh, pro proliferation of the endothelial cell will reduce the blood flow and less blood will be filtered. So they will reduce the um, glomerular filtration rate and it usually causes azotemia which, uh, which refers to elevated urea and creatinine and also oliguria. So there will also be a sodium and water retention um, which can uh, lead to fluid overload and causing hypertension. So the other complication uh, is acute kidney injury, chronic kidney disease, and, and stage, uh, which can lead to end-stage renal disease. Next, uh, next, I will proceed to the approach to uh, acute glomerulonephritis. So first, uh, so this is the case scenario that I, I get from a journal. So a seven years old boy presented to HTAA due to facial puffiness for one day duration. So because the patient come uh, with a complaint of swelling, so we need to inquire more about the swelling. So the, site, the site of the swelling, the onset and duration of the swelling, the character of the swelling, uh, is there any um, signs of inflammation? So the associated factors, the elevating factors. So for the answer, in this case, the facial puffiness is not associated with uh, redness or itchiness. And it occurred for one day duration. And the swelling is located on the face and no uh, swellings on any other such reported. So after uh, we have uh, get information about the swelling, we need to ask about the uh, any other symptoms such as fever or if you suspected the patient have acute glomerulonephritis, we can ask about the symptoms of the uh, acute glomerulonephritis such as coke, tea or smoky cut urine, reduced urine output, edema, or we can also uh, ask about sign that's suggesting the complication of the acute glomerulonephritis such as headache and visual disturbance which may can which may uh, due to the hypertension and also shortness of breath due to fluid overload so in this case uh, the patient had history of greenish sputum for three days and fever for two days and there's also a skin ulcer on the right feet for one month so this is so this is a table for the other history that we should ask about the patient. So for the past medical history, we should ask to identify any possible etiology agent, uh, especially streptococcal infection because it is common in the acute glomerulonephritis. So we should ask about the underlying systemic, systemic disease such as uh, Hinox conlin purpura and also systemic lupus erythematis. So um, uh, pay attention to the joint discomfort, any uh, rashes, Ask the patient about it. Ask the um, ask the mother of the patient to uh, about it. So the birth history, the immunization history, and nutritional history should be asked. Uh, so in this patient, there are no uh, significant finding in this three history. And for the recent medication exposure, is just uh, the the patient is given a topical agent for the. Oh, no, I'm oh, sorry, uh, it's, uh, it's nice. No? So the, for the history, it's also no significant finding. So for family history, it is important um, to know if there is any family member with autoimmune disorders, uh, such as SLE or membrane uh, proliferative glomerulonephritis, or uh, if the family history of the renal failure. So as specifically about the dialysis and kidney transplantation, uh, because there is an, a disease uh, called Alport syndrome which can manifest uh, as acute nephritic syndrome initially. So this is the table for the start and symptoms. So the patient can come with specific symptoms such as edema, facial puffiness, smoky or tea colored urine and reduced out 
urine output, or the patient can come with non-specific symptoms such as anorexia and lethargy, abdominal pain, or uh, the patient also can come with the complication of the symptoms, the shortness of breath, dizziness, and headache. So this is the sign of um, acute glomerulonephritis, cardinal features. So uh, the sign is our edema, hematuria, proteinuria, uremia, oliguria, uh, and it can be also hypertension. So this is the complication of, of uh, acute glomerulonephritis. So the patient can have hypertensive encephalopathy. So the symptoms uh, may be early and late. So the early symptom is restless and restless, drowsy and headache, where the late uh, present late symptom is visual disturbance, vomiting, nausea, cheeses, and coma. So the other complication is pulmonary edema. Uh, the patient can also get nephritic syndrome, irreversible renal failure, severe uremia, and hyperkalemia. So next for the physical examination, we should start with the general examination. Uh, examine whether the patient is conscious and alert, the target of fatigue, I examine the facial puffiness of the patient, any dysmorphism features. Uh, if the patient is in a respiratory distress, the cyanotic and jugular venous pressure. Uh, and also get the information about the height and weight of the patient. So in acute glomerulonephritis, it is um, it is important to check for the vital sign, especially the blood pressure, because uh, if the blood pressure is 5 millimeter uh, above the 99 percentile for the child uh, height, age, and sex, uh, and also if the patient come with uh, men um, altered mental status, so this means that the patient needs uh, prompt, uh, prompt attention. So if the patient have tachypnea and tachycardia, it can also uh, indicate a fluid overload, a fluid overload symptoms. So next, I examine the eye, the periorbital edema, and for face and neck, if cervical lymphadenopathy um, present, that means that there is a previous uh, infection, uh, most probably the pharyngitis, the pharyngitis. So for the skin, look for the rashes. So we can uh, look out for the causes of the glomerulonephritis, such as uh, SLE and H HSP. So for pulmonary, we can check for the uh, fluid overload. We, uh, we look out for the crackles and the pleural effusion. So for cardiac examination, in acute glomerulonephritis, uh, the cardiac failure can also be uh, one of the complications. So we must look out for the sign of the cardiac failure. For abdominal examination, if the patient present with uh, significant abdominal pain, it is usually associated with uh, HSP disease. So if there is um, involvement of the hepatomegaly or splenomegaly, then uh, they might be indicate that uh, there is a systemic involvement. So in acute glomerulonephritis, uh, there is also a per peripheral edema. So we must look for the edema and the limbs. So this is the clinical presentation of the patient, the periorbital edema and the facial puffiness. So for the case, so an examination, he was a cerebral and hemodynamically stable and there were resolved facial puffiness and healed lesion on the left feet with skin discomation. And there is no other swelling noted. So for investigation, um, for full blood count, there uh, anemia may be present. It is mainly delusional because of the expansion of the plasma volume because and uh, the leukocytosis may also be present. So for complement level, um, in most cases of acute glomerulonephritis, the citrate level will be low at the onset of symptoms and it should be normalized by six weeks. And for the C4 level, it usually within really normal limits in post-streptococcal uh, acute glomerulonephritis. So for renal function test, um, we should check for the blood urea and serum creatinine. It is uh, to as a uh, it is to measure uh, for the renal impairment. So electrolytes, we can uh, look up for the hyponatremia, hyperkalemia, or even metabolic acido acidosis, which can be the complication. So for the renal 
disease and culture. Uh, in most cases of acute glomerulonephritis, hematuria is present. So proteinuria uh, will be traced to positive 2, or it can be uh, up until nephrotic uh, range, but it usually associated with more severe uh, disease. So there will be also red blood cell cast, and pyuria may also present. So for this bacteria and serological evidence, uh, in acute glomerulonephritis, uh, they usually uh, have the rising of the anti titer. So this rising of the anti titer um, proved that there is a previous infection. So usually the uh, anti titer it is increased after the infection of the fat, uh, infection of the URTI. I mean, like the pharyngitis, the streptococcus pharyngitis, but it is uh, rare for the anti or titer to increase if the patient uh, have the streptococcus infection. So for us to uh, document that there is a skin uh, infection, so uh, increased anti dnsb uh, will be the better uh, indicator. So if we suspect the patient have um, autoimmune disease, we can do the antinuclear and anti uh, double stranded DNA antibody to confirm the uh, system the SLA. So for the antinotrophil uh, cytoplasmic antibody, uh, it is to diagnose granula, granulomatosis with polyangitis. So this disease usually um, appear with uh, the symptoms same, same as uh, acute glomerular nephritis. So next for the imaging, for the chest x-ray, if we um, suspecting there's a fluid overload, we can do the chest x-ray and also find cavitation if we uh, want to roll out the gran granulomatosis with polyangitis. So for renal ultrasound and biopsy, usually renal ultrasound uh, is not done because uh, if the patient have the clear cut of the acute nephritic syndrome, which means that the patient uh, manifests the sign and symptoms. But um, for renal biopsy, there is a indication for renal biopsy. So if the patient uh, is still resistant, uh, the patient uh, come with a typical presentation or severe renal failure, or the patient have prior history of renal disease or family history of nephritis. So uh, if the patient have features suggesting non-infectious uh, acute glomerulonephritis as cause of acute nephritis, or there is delay resolution in the patient. So we should do the biopsy to diagnose uh, the cause of the disease. So this is the lab finding. Uh, you guys can appreciate the cola colored urine or it is a tea colored urine. And it is the next picture is the red blood cell cast, which can be seen uh, under microscope. So in that case, um, the blood investigation show high total of white blood count. So it um, indicates there is uh, ongoing ongoing uh, infection. So the renal function showing the high urea and high creatinine, which uh, show the there is a renal impairment. And the liver function test show the high albumin level and normal liver enzymes. So it is important for us to rule out the um, disease caused by liver. So the urine examination uh, show high leukocyte, proteinuria, and hematuria. So this is the sign of uh, acute glomerulonephritis. And the anti streptolysin or titer is positive, which um, common in uh, acute glomerular nephritis, and also the serum C3 level was low. So how do we manage the patient? So the goals of the management is to treat the acute effects of the renal insufficiency. So we treat the edema, hypertension, hyperkalemia, and impaired renal clearance. So these are some of the supportive management that we can do, that we should do. So uh, first, we strip monitoring. So we should monitor the fluid intake, the urine output, the daily weight and blood pressure of the patient. We should uh, give penicillin V, penicillin uh, 5 or 4 uh, in 10 days to eliminate the beta hemolytic uh, streptococcal infection. Or if the patient is uh, allergic to the penicillin, we can get erythromycin. So to control the edema and circulatory overload, uh, there should be a fluid restriction during the oliguria phase until the diuresis and the uh, blood pressure of the patient is controlled. 
So for children with pulmonary edema, um, diuretic such as furosemide can be given and also can be uh, given as a hypertension treatment. So the patient should be on a low salt diet and we should look out for the complication uh, that the patient might present, such as a hypertensive encephalopathy, pulmonary edema, acute renal failure. So for dialysis, there's an indication for dialysis. So if the patient have acute pulmonary edema or hyperkalemia, severe acidosis, uremic symptoms, so we should uh, consider dialysis for the patient. So this, this is the management for the complication of the uh, acute pulmonary nephritis. So if the patient uh, manifests the complication of hypertension, these uh, are the list of uh, medicine that we can give to the patient. So for for detail uh, on how to manage a hypertension child, uh, you can you guys can um, read on case protocol. And uh, next for the pulmonary edema, uh, we should give oxygen and if necessary, a ventilatory support, or we uh, can give can give intra intra intravenous uh, uh, diuretics, restrict the fluid, or if there is no response to the diuretics. Uh, we should consider the hemodialysis. So for the severe acute kidney injury, um, the patient should undergo a uh, dialysis. So in this case, um, uh, during the admission of the patient, the patient uh, have a blood pressure of 198 uh, per 80 millimeter per mercury and he was given nifedipine for the uh, hypertension and the pressure puffiness uh, the patient was given uh, IV for sima and fluid restriction and the oral penicillin was also given. So in this patient, the patient did not develop the uh, complication which is a hypertensive encephalopathy. So for follow-up, uh, we need to follow up this patient for at least one year. So at every visit, we need to monitor the blood pressure and do urinalysis and renal function to evaluate the recovery of the patient. So. Um, by the time of the discharge, if the uh, citrial level of the patient did not uh, normalize, so we should repeat the citrial level six weeks later. So what is the prognosis of this acute glomerular nephritis? So in acute uh, post tractococcus glomerular nephritis specifically, more than 95% of children have complete recovery. So the recovery is usually within weeks. And there is uh, less than 1% of mortality. So the recurrence of this acute glomerulonephritis are extremely rare, especially for the post uh, streptococcus glomerulonephritis. So the mortality, uh, so this the mortality in acute stage can be avoided by appropriate management of acute renal failure, by management of acute renal failure, cardiac failure, and hypertension. So in the acute glomerulonephritis, the acute phase is infrequently severe. Uh, which can lead to the glomerulosclerosis and chronic renal disease. So this is my reference. Yeah, that's all for me. Thank you. So this is uh, a second part which is trying to let us go, go the concept of differential diagnosis of, of edema uh, in pediatric age. Okay. So who can answer the question? Hello? Can you hear me? Yes, doctor. Yes, doctor. Okay. Doctor. So what can be the causes now generally of edema? If you see the child, the number one, please, uh, Shazwan. What is it, doctor? Generalized differential diagnosis of edema in pediatric. Which organ can be? You now speak spoke to us about the kidney as nephrotic, and uh, Nagi has spoke about kidney as nephrotic. What others? 
other differential diagnosis. Um, cardiac disease. Okay. What else? Pulmonary hypertension. Pulmonary. What do you mean by pulmonary hypertension? Uh, blood flow caused by pedal edema. May, may, maybe, but we have many things which are more clear. We spoke about cardiac. Yes, this is uh, one cause. Another cause is we spoke about kidney nephrotic, nephrotic maybe, chronic renal failure like that. What else? Um, hepatic failure. Liver. Liver. So it can now, the major, major organs can be liver, kidney, heart, what else? Can be gastrointestinal also. We can lose protein through the gastrointestinal tract. It will go, give you, looks like nephrotic syndrome if it is very severe. Protein, lose, uh, protein losing also enteropathy. Okay. What about allergic diseases? Sometimes the allergic or severe autoimmune can be presented also by edema. What about malnutrition? Sometimes the child with, I think I presented this slide with you. Child who, is, who has Kwashiorkor and is edematous and he's also albumin who is slightly low, but he didn't fulfill the criteria of nephrotic syndrome because he is a very malnourished, okay? That's why we must put in our mind that differential diagnosis of childhood edema is a bit different. Now we got two of the most common uh, disease of the kidney, which can cause swollen and edema. Okay, so clinically it is very simple, as uh, Shazwani speak, and let you see that just to get a look for the urine color. If the two, uh, bottle of the urine, if you found it hematuria or non hematuria, it will guide you. Okay? And sometimes during the exam, we boot for you. We just present to you child with edema. You still have some swelling on the face, very orbital like that. And we boot for you two bottles of urine. One is cola color or tea colored, and the other is clear. Just to give you a clue, this is glomerulonephritis, which started to respond to the treatment, which is mainly antibiotics, okay? So you must take care about that. Uh, remember that the color of urine in glomerulonephritis looks like tea or cola. It is not red if you found the fresh blood, fresh hematuria, you must think about other causes, which can be stone, which can be malignancy, which can be UTI, whatever the cause, okay? Because the uh, glomerulonephritis means the in inflammatory process, okay, is upper. So the RBCs will be distracted and the one which you are going to see is the hemoglobinuria. It is not pure blood, okay? So if you find pure blood, you must revise your thinking again. Uh, of course, uh, Shazwani must uh, remembering us by the presentation sometimes of the Nephrotic syndrome, nephritic syndrome is 
severe hypertension. So the patient will come to the emergency department with convulsion. And just to go to the vital sign, which is vital, we found him hypertensive. At, the, at that point, we are going to check the urine for glomerulonephritis or other causes of hypertension. Okay. Uh, do you need to ask any questions? Okay, we can go ahead for the third presentation. Hey, can you guys see my slide? No, not yet. No? Yeah. No. Yes. Okay. Okay, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. My name is Umi Ifazakiah and I will be presenting about the urinary tract infection, UTI in childhood. These are the contents of the presentation. We'll start with the introduction and etiology and next predisposing factors, pathogens, uh, pathogenesis, uh, signs and symptoms, complication and also prevention. Then we'll move to the next part which is the approach to UTI where we will talk about the um, history taking, physical examination, investigation, and also management. So let's start. So we'll start with the introduction and etiology. Urinary tract infection, UTI, comprises 5% uh, of febrile illnesses in early childhood. Before the age of 2 years old, 2.1% of girls and 2.2% of boys have had a UTI. About 3 to 7% of girls and 1 to 2% of boys have at least one symptomatic urinary tract infection before the age of six years. Uh, and 12 to 30% of them have a recurrence within a year. Uh, this immunologies, it is called urethritis when it is uh, infection of the urethra, hyalonephritis when uh, it is the infection of the kidney, cystitis, infection of the urinary bladder, and it is termed as asymptomatic bacteria when there is presence of bacteria in the urine in an otherwise asymptomatic child. Uh, atypical urea, atypical uh, UTI is the infection when the infection is caused by organism other than E. coli, uh, poor urine flow, abdominal or bladder mass, elevated creatinine, septicemia, failure to respond to uh, treatment, with suitable antibiotics within 48 hours. Recurring UTI is when there are three episodes within the previous 12 months, or when there are 12, uh, when, when there are two episodes within the previous six months. For the etiology, uh, Escherichia coli is the most common bacterial cause of UTI. It accounts for about 80% of UTI in, uh, ch in children. The other gram-negative bacteria that can cause UTI include Capsiella, Proteus, um, Proteus uh, Enterobacter, and also Citrobacter. As for the gram-positive bacteria, the agents include Staphylococcus, Staphylococcus, Enterococcus, and also Staphylococcus aureus. As for the viruses, it can be caused by adenovirus, enterovirus, coxsackievirus, and also ecovirus. As for the fungi, fungi is very uncommon, but uh, there are a few risk factors that predispose the child to getting an, a, fungal, a fungal UTI, uh, which is immunosuppression or any long-term usage of broad-spectrum antibiotics. So the fungi that can uh, cause uh, UTI 
are candi candida species, Aspergillus species, and also Cryptococcus neoformans. Next is the predisposing factors. As for the age, uh, the prevalence is highest in boys less than one year old and also in girls uh, less than four years old. The next factor is lack of circumcision, in which uncircumcised male infants have four to eight folds higher prevalence of UTI than circumcised uh, male, male infants. The next one is female infants. They have two to four folds higher prevalence of UTI than male infants due to the short urethra and also uh, genetic factors in which a child that has first degree relative with UTI is more likely to have UTI than the individuals without such history. This is uh, due to the adherence of bacteria and also density of uh, E. coli receptor at the very urethral area may be genetically determined. The next one is urinary obstruction that can be anatomic, neurologic, and also functional condition. As for the anatomic condition, uh, one is called the posterior urethral valve PUV, in which there is a, de a development of uh, an obstructive membrane at the urethra that can block the urine from passing out. And the other one is ureteropelvic junction, UP obstruction. Uh, in which there is a narrowing of the ureter uh, proximal to the pelvis of kidney that will later uh, obstruct the pathway of uh, urine from the kidney to the bladder. The next one is neurologic condition such as myelomeningocele with uh, neuro neurogenic bladder. As for the functional condition, there is um, they might be bladder or bowel dysfunction such as um, the child has difficulty in controlling the sphincter or uh, any bowel or the bowel constipation. And the next factor is incomplete bladder emptying, uh, which is contributed by a few factors, such as infrequent voiding, resulting in bladder enlargement, and also vulvitis and also obstruction by a loaded rectum from constipation. The next factor is vesico-ureteric reflux, VUR, uh, which is the retrograde passage of urine uh, that move from the bladder to the upper urinary tract. So uh, for the mild, it is one of the most, it is the most common anomaly uh, in urologic, urologic anomaly in children. And uh, a child with VUR has high risk of developing recurring UTI. It can be mild as, is, as it reflux uh, to the ureter only and it can be severe when there is gross dilatation of the ureter, pelvic, uh, renal pelvic, and also renal calyces. The next one is antenatally diagnosed renal or urinary tract abnormality. Uh, for example, horseshoe kidney. This is when uh, there is fusion of the um, kidney, and usually it occurs at the lower pole. So in this condition, it is usually associated with uh, UPG obstruction, the obstruction, uh, so the child may present with UTI. The next one is duplicated ureter in which there are two ureters uh, draining a kidney. So it can, uh, it can be, it can be complete, like you see this one. Uh, this is when the complete one, and there are two uh, ureter coming from the kidney and entering the bladder as two also. But if uh, it is incomplete, there will be one from kidney but there will be fusion somewhere along the way that they will enter the bladder as one tube. The other one is polycystic kidney disease, PKD, uh, which is an inherited, uh, inherited disorder uh, when there are clusters of cysts developed in the kidney uh, and this will cause the kidney to enlarge and lose function over time. And the common complication of PKD is UTI. Next is pathogenesis. So it starts with the colonization of the periurethral area by the enteric pathogen. And then uh, the pathogen will attach to the uroepithelial cell via an active process mediated by glycosphingolipid receptor at the surface of the um, surface of the epithelial cell. And then this bacterial attachment will recruit toll-like receptor, TLR, 
which is a transmem a family of transmembrane co-receptor uh, that is involved in the recognition of uh, pathogen associated pat protein pattern that will trigger a cytokine response. So uh, that uh, from this cytokine response, they will generate the uh, inflammatory process. There are a few virulent, there are a variety of virulent factors that will enable the bacteria to ascend. Uh, for example, in E. coli, the most common, uh, the most common pathogen of UTI, they have pili, which is a, a hair-like appendages that will enhance their adherence to the uh, uro, uh, uro epithelial cell. And in the bladder and kidney, when they arrive, uh, they will the bacteria in the colon will generate an intense inflammatory response. For the signs and symptoms, uh, it's uh, different from the infants and children. Usually, an infant is very um, it's quite uh, non-specific, where they will appear with fever, vomiting, uh, lethargic, irritability, poor feeding, altering growth, in which um uh. They will have uh, slow weight gain and also offensive urine, which is foul smelling urine. As for the child uh, above one year old, they will uh, they may present with dysuria, urgency and frequency, abdominal pain, uh, fever with or without rigors, lethargy, vomiting, diarrhea, hematuria, offensive or cloudy urine, and also febrile seizure. As for the complication. Um, bacteremia is uh, the common complication of the uh, of the UTI, uh, along with the renal insufficiency, uh, is one of the known uh, well known complication that either come from the pyelonephritis uh, per se or any uh, pre existing congenital renal anomaly that predispose the child to have UTI, yeah. and then uh, it can also be caused by the usage of nephrotoxic antibiotics. Next one is hydronephrosis, which is the swelling of the kidney. Uh, this is where this is when the urine is blocked uh, in the kidney because um, the ureter is uh, ureter is blocked. So the kidney will build up in uh, the urine will build up in the kidney. And the next one is renal abscess and also renal scarring that uh, that has a later risk of hypertension. The next one is prevention. Uh, as for the uh, parents, they should uh, avoid giving bubble bath to the children, especially for the female uh, children, because the bacteria and also soap or any um, small substance may enter the urethra very easily. The next one is to get enough fluids intake. Uh, this is for the flushing out of the bacteria that may be present in asymptomatic ch child, and also uh, change diaper diapers frequently in uh, younger children and also to teach older children proper hygiene for maintaining a clean genital area, encourage the child to use the bathroom frequently rather than holding in urine, teach the child about the safe wiping technique which is to wipe from the front to the back because this is to prevent the bacteria from the anus to enter the urethra. And the last one is prophylactic antibiotics that can be uh, that is indicated for the recurrent UTI. The next one is history taking. So this is the as, example of uh, how the patient may present. Okay, so it, this is about Jake, a two-month-old infant who stopped feeding and had a high intermittent fever for three days. He was referred to hospital where he had an inf infection screen. When further asked, the mother claimed that Jake's urine was foul smelling. He slept longer and more frequent and he was, if he was awake, he appeared lethargic and irritable. He also refused to be respected. So uh, what to us when, uh, about the history of the child, of the patient? So uh, we should ask about past medical history of any chronic urinary symptoms, such as um, um, pain or uh, any urgency, and also chronic constipation, previous UTI or previous undiagnosed febrile illnesses, or uh, vesicourethral reflux VR. Drug history, but there's no significant, there's not much in between. Uh, birth history, whether the child is uh, antenatally diagnosed with renal or urinary tract abnormality, and also um, developmental history, but usually 
as normal. Uh, the nutritional history, whether the child is given adequate nutrients or any loss of appetite that may expand the fathering growth, and also family history of frequent UTI, VR, or other genital urinary abnormalities. As for the social history, uh, we should ask whether the child was ever uh, sexually abused. The next one is physical examination. So uh, we'll do the step from the genital examination, vital sign, anthropometric, and also the, um, the systems. And what to notice in child with possible UTI is that when there is uh, increase in temperature, uh, indicative of um, fever, and also uh, elevated blood pressure when there is uh, renal scarring. And also uh, to uh, the child may present with poor weight gain. And also for the, when the um, palpation on the abdominal and pelvic examination, we will find out that the child may have suprapubic and costal vertebral angle tenderness and also enlarged bladder or kidney that may indicate urine obstruction. On PR examination, palpable tool stool in the colon may indicate uh, constipation. The next one is for the external uh, to do an inspection of the external genitalia. Uh, to look for the signs of vulva, vaginitis, um, such as redness or any um, false smelling discharge or any vaginal foreign body in sexually abused child. And also to evaluate the lower back of the child to look for the signs of myelomeningocele that, uh, that is associated with bladder, uh, bladder neuro, neurogenic bladder. And uh, the signs include pigment, uh, midline pigmentation, lipoma, vascular lesion, sinus, and also top of hair. For the investigation, uh, full blood count, uh, when full blood count is done, uh, the white blood cell count may or may not be elevated. Full blood count is not diagnostic in this uh, UTI. For the dipstick analysis, we should, uh, we should see the uh, leukocyte and also leukocyte esterase and also nitrite to be positive in children with UTI. And uh, for the leukocyte esterase, uh, the positive uh, leukocyte esterase is suggestive of UTI, but it's non specific. But for the nitrate, it is highly specific with a low post positive rate. As for the microscopic examination, um, there will be, uh, uh, we will use the uh, microscope to see the urine for the detection of bacteria and also elevated white blood cell. As for the urine culture, it is routinely performed in children. All children are less than two years old, even if the dipstick analysis or microscopic examination is negative. And for the children uh, more than two years or two years, the uh, results of the dipstick in, uh, analysis and also microscopic analysis can be used to decide whether to obtain a urine culture or not. And the other lab test uh, that is not routinely done is the markers of inflammation, such as ESR, CRP and also PCT. And also for the serum creatinine in children with a history of multiple UTI and is suspected of renal involvement. For the imaging studies, this is done uh, to look for any uh, urinary tract abnormality or any obstruction. So for the ultrasound, this is indicated in all children less than three years of age. However, for children more than three years, uh, the one that is indicated to do ultrasound is uh, when the child is um, have the child has uh, atypical or recurring UTI. The next one is the MSA scan, which is a, uh, which is when we use a chemical called diver acid, uh, the MSA that will be linked to a to a radioisotope that will be uh, introduced to the child. Uh, through IV. IV. <coughs> so, um, and then uh, there will be emission of uh, gamma ray and it will be projected into pictures. This is uh, indicated in atypical UTI. And also for uh, the next one is micturating cystourethrogram, MCUG. Uh, this is when we use a special type of X-ray 
uh, that will uh, that also that uses a contrast dye uh, to allow us to see the bladder and also uh, urethra uh, in real time as the bladder uh, is filled and also empty. This is uh, indicated in infants with recur recurring UTI and also children less than three years old with the following features such as dilatation of um, ultrasound, poor urine flow, uh, non E. coli infection, and also family history of PR. As for the management, <clears throat> most children that, that, can, uh, that are not vomiting uh, can be treated with um, orally administered uh, antibiotics. So the preferred oral regimen will be the cephalosporin. In children with high likelihood of renal involvement or uh, immune deficiency, they will be given the second generation of cephalosporin, which is cefuroxime, or third generation cephalosporin, uh, set, such as cefixime, acetinib, or ceftibutin. As for the children with low risk of renal involvement, they will be given the first generation of cephalosporin, which is cephalexine. Uh, as for the parental therapy, outpatient uh, parental therapy is indicated in uh, children more than two months old uh, that is unable to tolerate oral therapy. And also, um, uh, they will be given uh, once, daily, uh, once daily parental uh, parental administration of gentamicin or ceftriaxone. The next one is inpatient parental therapy. This is indicated for children less than two months old and also for children that is failed to respond to outpatient parental therapy. Uh, so uh, they will be given a combination of ampicillin and gentamicin or gentamicin alone or third or fourth generation cephalosporin. As for the prophylactic antibiotics, this is uh, considered in children with recurrent UTI or at risk of getting the uh, recurring UTI. They will be given trimetopim, sulfamethoxazole, or uh, nitrofurantoin. So that is all from me. These are the references. I'm really sorry I didn't put the uh, website link. So that is all from me. Is there any question? So thank you, Effa, for concise but a good one. Uh, UTI in the children is, is a very important and sometimes missed one. Even it will be included in uh, Bayerics of Undetermined Origin sometimes. Uh, so take care, but the, the good issue that uh, she covered uh, the young infants, OK? Uh, up to three months of age, uh, we are dealing with it differently, okay? Because uh, I think in many cases uh, or many situations we are asking what is the best module for imaging. Uh, I think you have this uh, radiology for small infants, which is very, very important. Most of you are going to sit CT, IVU is going to give uh, intravenous for a small baby die like that, which is not suitable for this age. This is the gold standard ultrasound. We may use uh, the DIMSA scan. You must write the complete name of the DIMSA. Okay, dimer category like that. Uh, and the benefit of DIMSA, remember that the, the S denote for fibrosis. Because uh, in case of uh, vesicoureteric reflux, the direction of the urine, suppose it is one way, coming from kidney to ureter to bladder to urethra to outside. If there is reflux, it is now regurgitation. It will cause infection and it will cause fibrosis of the kidney, which can end on in the stage renal disease. So this one just to detect the
umbilication, which is fibrosis, and the MCUG is giving you the diagnosis. You just through your urethra, you are trying to inject some dye, and after some time, they are doing the X-ray to see is it coming out alone or coming out and up. Okay, uh, so this is the gold standard for infant. You can just put it at the one of the conclusion at the end, please. So it will not be missed with that, okay? Also for a small infant, we, we must give the intravenous injection. We are not giving oral, small infants. Because she wrote in the next slide, oral or IV antibiotic. No, we are going for IV antibiotic and it may be prolonged up to 10 to 14 days trying to clear up the infection. Otherwise, as I told you, the kidney can be destroyed. Uh, always, always please remember to include, include urine analysis in any septic situation. It is a part of septic profile. So you must remember it and to try to request it in, uh, in any suspected sepsis. As you know, even when we are speaking about uh, before diarrhea and gastroenteritis, we know that parenteral diarrhea or parenteral gastroenteritis can be due to UTI. UTI in childhood, sometimes it is very, very, very big. Uh, if I spoke about general uh, guidance and general instruction to the family, which is very important. And the one of it is the constipation. If the one has constipation and he need to go to toilet many times trying to pass urine, he is susceptible for infection, especially for ladies. Okay. Uh, good uh, presentation. I think I will uh, uh, offer Nagiha uh, 8.5 after doing the correction. Otherwise, I will drop here to 7. You have a short time to do that. Uh, Nur Shazwani, uh, eligible to good eight, also IFA. Okay, this is your marking. Uh, thank you for your uh, presentation. Uh, and everyone need to do, complete his job. So for uh, Nagiha, she need to update, especially the treatments. Okay, and the... Uh, Updating also the complication, which is infection and the thrombosis and the like that, need to be added for Noor Shazwani, uh, better to add the differential diagnosis of edema. Because nephrotic syndrome is, is a very big uh, one. And remember that uh, we need to add also one slide about the follow-up <coughs> of nephrotic syndrome. Okay, nephrotic syndrome, Sometimes we, we make, uh, we give the family false uh, message. They ask us, is yes, nephrotic syndrome is a benign disease, usually we resolve uh, like that soon after a course of antibiotic, but we are not telling you the complete truth that about 2% of a childhood can be complicated and got resistant to hypertension or even kidney injury. So if you are going to give this message to the family, take care, don't give false hope, and don't give the, what if it's the message that the family will feel safe so they will not come back for follow up. So you must tell the family clearly. And the counseling, uh, inshallah, we need to, to practice it from now. It is completely different than I tell, yeah, glomerular nephritis is usually a benign disease which responded to treatment and the child became okay or are not afraid of complication. Uh, I would like to see you after one month. So the mother after one month, my child looks normal and the doctor assured me. But if you tell her the other way to be honest and clear, I would like to inform you that the results are very good, but there is a small percentage which you can continue to have microscopic hematuria, which we cannot see it by our eyes, but we need to do the lab test for that. Also, some of them got hypertension. 
another complication we are afraid for the kidney to be affected in a small portion of the childhood. So at least you will stay with us for one year. I know that your child at the time usually looks very, very, very normal, but we are trying to go a deep vision about his progress. So yes, she will come and ask every time why you are doing uh, urine, how, how is it, in spite of asking why I'm doing urine, she will ask you how much is the RBC today, what about the blood pressure of my child, like that, okay? So please, it is very, very, very important to be sensitive about any word you are telling the family. You must be honest, clear, professional, thinking about the perception of the other. Maybe the family perceives it wrongly or correctly. It is very important. Okay. Thank you for your job today. And to see you again, inshallah, for uh, another meetings. Uh, how many candidates came in from Red Zone? Uh, seven, doctor. Seven. So they came back to Kuantan, or what happens with them? According to UIA guideline, they cannot go to, cannot enter so, the university. No, they can enter Kuantan, but they not eligible to enter to our campus. They need to stay two weeks in red area. Oh. Take care about that. So they must leave this area, which is red, and they come to a green area. Okay, and they stay there for two weeks. If they are asymptomatic, we will be to join us. If uh, have symptoms, you are going to send them for COVID and uh, do the regulation for COVID, which is more shortic. Oh. Okay. The second thing today, the attendance after 15 minutes, it was only 32. And I can see it now, it is 33. So your total number is? Okay, so you must make the table of attendance and the one who didn't attend, they must submit why they didn't attend and send it to our sign officer's sister Farah. Okay. Okay. Uh, doctor, I have a question. Yes. Uh, according to the timetable, inshallah, our session, learning session will start at 11 November. Okay. So how how for the red zone student because they haven't go into the green area yet. Yeah, they, yeah. I, I even one of you sent to me and I asked it and the reply to him. They must move now, otherwise they need to be away from that. Let us see. This six student seven or six seven. Okay, just uh, you must uh, go through formally and uh, the one, uh, the group uh, coordinator must uh, speak to the head of the department that you have seven candidates now moved already to Kuantan or to other area, which is uh, a green one. So we can discuss how can we help them, but you must start very early. Oh, okay, I understand that. Okay. Okay, any other uh, points? Okay, just uh, everyone uh, of you need to, to do his correction, even uh, if I need to, to do just uh, one about the infant, which has a specific way of investigation and the treatment, okay? Uh, and prove it to me after correction. And uh, thank you. And see you again, inshallah. Doctor, doctor. Yes. Uh, sorry, but but regarding the quarantine for red zone, actually, um, many students wanted to do that. But suddenly, the UIA um, committee for COVID uh, prevented the red zone students from quarantining for two weeks. So even if they quarantine outside of their red zone for two weeks, they can't they still can't enter. 
that's why we won't have the seven students soon. No, 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 no. I asked Prof. Marzuki himself day before yesterday. Who told you that? Because <laughs> that was their decision two days ago. I believe like they told the red students. Can I mind? I asked Prof. Marzuki. He said they need to go out from the red zone to any green zone, even if they need to come to quarantine, but they are not allowed to join our campus until they are 14 days in a green zone, then we bully them if they are asymptomatic. If they have symptoms, we are going to investigate. You must have a formal channel for that, please. You must take decision rapidly. I know it sometimes it, it is difficult, but to be late, uh, make anything worse. Okay? Okay, Doctor. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much, Doctor. Welcome, welcome. Just to, to the group uh, who is absent and descend to Farah the attendance, please. Okay. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Wa alaikum wa salam wa rahmatullah. Thank you, Doctor. Thank you, Doctor. Thank you, Doctor. Thank you, Doctor. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.